Hello and welcome to the PC Security Channel. Today we'll be taking a look at CLOP Ransomware, an interesting case study in ransomware versus police. Of course, we're going to take a look at the sample in a VM, run it, and show you what it does and some of the key indicators that you need to look out for. And there are a couple of interesting things about this ransomware, but before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of this threat because it is quite interesting. The origins of CLOP ransomware start all the way back in 2019, but since then the police have been tracking them down. And as per the video, you can see below. They were actually tracked down in Ukraine and police seized a lot of their infrastructure, including $180,000 and high-end cars like Tesla and Mercedes. Like, I don't know what's up with the high-end cars and ransomware authors. It's not a great investment, like cars depreciate, but then again, I guess if you're economically smart, you don't go building ransomware. So this was in the summer of 2021. Since then, however, the ransomware seems to have reawakened. I don't know how, maybe they have decentralized, right? Whether be it their affiliates or other people who have access to the source code, this ransomware has been active since then. And funnily enough, they actually did manage to strike back in late 2021 and managed to hack the coal limited. The reason this is a big deal is because the coal manages a lot of IT infrastructure for the government, including police databases. So when they were breached, one of the main concerns was that the police databases associated with them may have gone to the hackers and been released on the dark web. And some of the details that were in there were things like list of suspects, crime records, uh, vulnerable people. You know, the exact kind of data you wouldn't want to end up in the dark web where criminals can access it. I've been doing some research into what exactly was breached and there's some conflicting information about whether or not the police database itself was breached. But be that as it may, this is a largely active threat. So we're going to take a look at this sample. As you can see, it's on our test system. We're just gonna rename it as an exec and go straight for it, Geronimo. And now we're going to open up Task Manager. We're going to see the CPU usage spike up. But as you can see, this thread does not take up a ton of CPU right away. It's going to hover at around 13%, if I'm not wrong. Yep, 12.6 kind of limits itself to 13%. And the reason for that is, well, if you're just a user and you have this ransomware payload deployed in the background by the hacker, you might notice the fan spinning up if it was taking up 100% of the CPU and you might get suspicious. And as you can imagine, if you're infecting a large corporation, it is going to take some time for them to encrypt all of your data. So if you're suspicious and you go checking your task manager, you could shut it down. So in order to prevent you from suspecting anything, they kind of limit it to 13% of CPU usage. That way you don't notice anything weird with the fans, nothing spins up, your system doesn't slow down, so it happens neatly in the background. Take note, Norton Crypto Miner, <laughs> which actually maxes out your resources right away. But that is one of the things that I guess makes these types of threats more dangerous in some ways, because if you have a payload that just spikes up to 100%, you might notice it and go to task manager and terminate the process or even just shut down your system and that can limit the damage. Now we are going to open up our documents and we'll see what's going on here. As you can see, we're already too late to save our plays of Shakespeare. Just had the readme pop up. Everything is encrypted. We're just going to go ahead and open this and read. So it says your network has been penetrated. A little bit different language than what typical ransomware says. All files on each host in the network have been encrypted with a strong algorithm. Backups were either encrypted or deleted or backup disks were formatted. <laughs> so they're saving you the trouble of, uh, you know, going through and figuring out what happened. Shadow copies also removed... So F8 or any other methods may damage encrypted data, but not recover. We exclusively have decryption software for your situation. No decryption software is available in the public. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? They just um, give you a full description of what their program does. Like, okay, we delete shadow copies. We format your backup disks. Saves time for the malware analysts. So that's kind of nice of them. Do not reset or shut down. False may be damaged. 
So they've pretty much got FAQs for the customer in the readme file. This is kind of funny. Like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> this is really in-depth. It seems like, you know, they sat down in a room together with a whiteboard, and they're like, let's talk about our customer experience. What are the questions typical customers are going to have? We want to make sure we answer them on our public-facing GUI. They did their market research. It's kind of weird because they even mentioned specific decryptors like PhotoRec, Ranaw Decryptor, etc. Repair tools are useless and can destroy your files irreversibly. If you want to restore your files, write to emails and attach two to three encrypted files, less than five meg, non-archived, and your files should not contain valuable information. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> okay, we're gonna decrypt something, but not valuable, because then you might just not pay us and get away with it because I guess they know that you know the real valuable data may not be large in size and that may allow other people to decrypt I I don't know what's going on but yeah it's kind of funny the way they say it shouldn't contain valuable information like you give them something and they're like no no too valuable <laughs> you will receive decrypted samples in our condition. And funny, your warranty, decrypted samples. Do not rename encrypted files. <laughs> so it's, you've got a warranty. Do not try to decrypt your data using third-party software. They've really done their market research, man. It's like they've got specific decryptors in mind that someone may try. The final price depends on how fast you write to us. Ah, that's interesting. They're giving you some negotiation advice as well. After two weeks, your files will be deleted automatically. Contact email serviced Iggy Logos at protonmail.com. That's a weird name. Manager Smears. Okay, so they're trying to appear professional, even though they have the name of a unicorn nursery character. So while we're reading this, as you can see, we've got a couple of files on the desktop, encrypts the INI file as well. So the reason this pops up when ransomware is executed is because by default, this file is hidden. But when the ransomware modifies it, it becomes unhidden. And we have the same readme here. So that's CLOP ransomware. Now we're going to try to do a deeper analysis using Intrazer Analyze, our sponsors. First, I'm going to just look for it. So we're going to look for CLOP ransomware. And the family should be identified. Now, as you can see, we've got several samples dating all the way back to April 4th of 2021. Let's see if we can show more. So... Some of the originals from 2019 are very different. The first one on April 4th um, and April 3rd seems like a new variant because as you can see, the virus total results are very low. So this was only detected by six out of 69 engines at the time. And that's an important thing to note because uh, yeah, if you're hit by it at that time and your AV does not have appropriate zero day defenses to block the behavior of encryption, you're toast. And now the sample we have may be newer, so I'm just going to analyze that. So this is our sample. As you can see, we've got an 88.3% correlation with CLOP ransomware, 54 detections at the moment, so it is well known. And if we look at TTPs, it does a pretty good job of hiding that. So we're not able to map any MITRE techniques directly onto it, but you can look at the IOCs. Interestingly, there are no network IOCs. So again, if it does communicate with its CNC, it does a good job of obfuscating that. Interestingly, though, if you look at behavior, it does run in a sandbox and it does its encryption in a sandbox as well. Now, I want to compare this with some of the other samples we have because it is possible that different versions of the malware had different purposes in mind. So some of the earlier versions could be a more direct deployment where you have one file that's designed to sit on the system and also do the encryption. And later on, they may have separated those files. So you may just have an encryptor payload. So we're going to look into the one from April 4th, the one with low detections, because it may be better obfuscated. That could have been the reason it had lower detections. And as you can see, the match is only 13.97% and a lot more is Enigma protector. So this is a packer they use to obfuscate their samples. So those of you who wonder, well, how do malware samples manage to avoid detection? It's by packing because that completely changes the code structure. So a lot of the things and rules that AV signatures have are just not going to work until the file is unpacked, which is why again, in-memory scanning is kind of useful. Now, if we look at the behavior on this one, as you can see, nothing does not execute in a sandbox or at least doesn't do the encryption. So I guess that's an interesting overview for you guys in terms of how samples can differ and also what makes detecting 
new malware samples challenging. The most concerning thing about the sample is it doesn't do anything obvious in terms of behavior that I can C would be manually blacklisted or something that'd be picked up by most SOC teams. So something to really look out for. If you want to do an in-depth analysis yourself, of course, please check out analyze.intizer.com. You can set up a community account and use it for free or check out some of their enterprise offerings if you're a business. Also, if you're a business, feel free to get in touch with us if you'd like to figure out how susceptible your systems are to ransomware and if you want to do some of the tasks that we do. And for everyone else, please like and share the video if you enjoy it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of awesome stuff coming up. I'm really excited for it. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay informed, stay secure.